Did you know that Last Epoch has a limit to how much ward it can display on the health bar? Probably not, because that would require you to generate more than 65,000 ward, or 65,500 to be exact, and that would be impossible, right? Well, I'm here to tell you that not only is it possible to have that much ward at once, but it's actually quite easy if you know what you're doing. And it's all with the help of this innocent looking node right here on the Spriggan form tree. More on that later. But what happens once you go past 65,500 ward, I hear you ask? Well, look at my health bar at the bottom left. How much ward does it look like I have? Just over 6,000, right? Wrong! Let's unpause the video and watch what happens. Yes, once you generate so much ward you go past the display limit of 65,500, it overflows into a second bar and actually resets the count. That's right, the 6,000 ward I showed a second ago, that's actually added on top of the 65,500, so that my total ward right now is just over 71,500. But back to having so much ward it has to overflow into a secondary bar, if you are like me, you've already asked yourself, what happens once that secondary bar fills up past 65,500 again? But hold on a second, that would require us to generate close to 140,000 ward, and surely there would be no way to do that in a game. I mean, come on. Well, continuing the theme of how stupid this build can be, and again I'm going to touch on the build itself later, not only is it possible, but watch this. Currently, it looks like I have exactly 19,394 ward. Let's unpause the video and count the amount of ward bars I go through. Remember, each new one is going to start at 65,500. So we start with this one, one, two, And three. That's right, in this video you're seeing my character have exactly, let's do the math, 19,394 plus 65,500 plus 65,500 equals 150,394 ward at a given time. And by the way, I'm going to explain how I'm able to generate so much ward on my character in a minute. This is not an exploit and absolutely uses the intended game mechanics on a normal character. The question is, is this too strong and should the devs do something about it? This build basically allows you to ignore almost all boss mechanics except for a handful. I don't know how they're supposed to balance around you having 30 to 60 thousand health when a normal character has around 5,000. However, the build is very limited in its damage output, and well, so far in this video, I've shown an extreme version where I'm trying to push my ward as high as possible. Basically, every way in which you can build damage on the build requires you to sacrifice some of your ward. Also, consider that in order to do damage, you have to either take hit damage from enemies or be in melee range. So, in my honest opinion, a slight nerf might be in order, but it would be sad to see this build phased out of the game completely. The rest of this video is divided into two sections. The first will explain how it's possible to have this much ward. The second is a complete guide for the build in its functional form. So first I'm going to explain the interaction in this build that allows you to have so much ward at once. If you just want to jump straight into the guide, and you don't really care about the mechanics of how everything works, feel free to skip ahead to that section in the video. Okay, so how does it work? As you can see right now by my health bar, I have almost no ward and no health. Now, I briefly mentioned this node before on the Sprig Inform tree, Leaf Barrier, which provides you with ward equals to your armor as a value, when you enter Spriggan form. My armor right now is 1660, and that's gonna be turned into ward when you transition into Spriggan form. And as you can see, I get that much ward. So if we played Druid before, you understand that Thorn Shield is a very easy way to generate um, armor. 
And with Leaf Bear, you obviously want to get as much armor as possible. So Thorn Shield gives you armor for every stack and use all the nodes right here to increase the efficiency and the duration the ability to stack Thorn Shield. But you also have to consider this node right here, Roar of the Woodland. Which makes it so that when you enter bear form from Spriggan form, it increases the duration of all stacks already on you of Thorn Shield by a flat 4 seconds. Now, that by itself might not sound very impressive, but you have to consider that the thing that restricts the potential of the build the most is cooldown reduction. This is because the more cooldown reduction you have, the more often you can enter Spriggan form, which generates your ward, and also the more often you can enter bear form, which increases the duration of your thorn shields. This means cooldown recovery speed is the most important stat that we have. Okay, so how do we build cooldown recovery speed? First, let me quickly explain how cooldown recovery speed as a stat works, because it is not cooldown reduction. The calculation is done a little differently, but it's easy to understand. Basically, you need to think of it as you, with no cooldown reduction, no cooldown recovery speed, you have a base 100% cooldown recovery speed, which means 6 seconds are 6 seconds. Cooldown recovery speed is then added on top of the 100% base. So that means if I have 64% right now, it's actually 164%. An easy thing to help you understand that is to remember that at 100% additional cooldown recovery speed, you get 50% cooldown reduction. So 6 seconds become 3 seconds. The calculation is done as follows. 100% divided by 200%, which is the 100% base plus 100% additional, equals 50% or 0.5, one half. If I want to calculate how much cooldown reduction I currently have, I start by taking my cooldown recovery speed, which right now is at 78%, and adding it to the 100% base to be 178% or 1.78. And then, as the formula goes, we go 1 divided by 1.78 equals 0.56 rounding down. And now we need to take that 0.56 and multiply it by 6, which would be the 6 seconds that are the cooldown of my ability. This equals 3.36 seconds or 3.4 rounded up which is what you see on the cooldown duration of my transform ability. So, how do we build cooldown recovery speed? Well, to begin with, we can craft it on items, specifically boots and belts. This is a general increased cooldown recovery speed, and a tier 5 provides up to 20%. In addition to that, some items have an inherent base stat of cooldown recovery speed on them. This chest armor, for example, available to the prime list, provides up to 12% cooldown recovery speed, and these rings with each one individually providing up to 10%. And the last piece of the puzzle is a helmet prefix, which provides a tier 5 up to 16% cooldown recovery speed when transformed. Now this is great for us because effectively we are always transformed. We always switch between Spriggan form and Werebear form, and we never actually go back to human form. If you look at my cooldown recovery speed at the bottom, it now says 64%. If I transform, it then turns into 78. The next way we scale how much ward we can have, obviously, is by being able to retain that ward. Which brings us to ward retention. Intelligence provides 4% ward retention per point. However, as we play as a primalist in this build, we don't get much else from it. Another way we can build ward retention is with items that directly provide that stat, like this offhand catalyst right here. In fact, this catalyst makes such a big impact that when you're just starting the build, it's absolutely necessary to find one of those with pretty good stats. But as a primalist, we have another secret way to get ward retention, which is, mostly ignored by most people, getting intelligence from this node right here on the Stormcrow tree. At 5 points into the node, it provides 10 intelligence for each crow that you have. This means that if I summon 2 crows, I get 80% ward retention. This node on the Stormcrow tree is actually very important when you're just beginning the build, 
because you don't have, again, a lot of ways to get word retention as a primalist. Also, storm crows can provide you word when they heal you if you are below 50% health. Now, on a primalist, this is potentially very useful because you have this node, Berserker, which gives you double melee damage and 25% global damage reduction. And if you're not sure how to make your build low life, you simply have to use these boots, Last Steps of the Living. Last Steps of the Living is a unique that is one of the easiest to farm in the game. It drops from Formicist the Undying and has a common 50% chance to drop when you kill him. Formicist the Undying is the end boss of the timeline, Blood, Frost and Death, which is accessible fairly early when you start doing monoliths. The way these boots work is that they provide a degen to your health. They also regenerate ward each second based on a percentage of the health that you're missing. So at low life, you're gonna start generating a lot of ward. But right now, I'm getting over a thousand ward retention on a primalist. So how am I doing that? Well, this is where these gloves, Frostbite Shackles, come in. The good news is that Frostbite Shackles drop from exactly the same boss as Last Steps of the Living, Formus is the Undying, so you don't need to take any extra steps if you're already farming the boots. However, these gloves are absolutely mandatory for the build. At first look, the item might seem unimpressive. But first, pay attention to this part. 1% ward retention per 1% uncapped cold resistance. What this means is that you can scale ward retention with cold resistance. This allows me to completely neglect my health pool because I'm never going to take health damage. My effective HP is going to be all ward and I can put all my points into ward generation and ward retention. In this way, cold resistance basically becomes my health pool. Another thing about the gloves that I'll just briefly mention is this stat right here that gives you a chance to apply frostbite on a hit, that is any hit. This is absolutely amazing for us on the build because aside from reflect damage, which is a very good option on the build, our main damage source scales with applying ailments and damage over time. Once I have frostbite shackles, you can see that any item that has cold resistance on it provides to me both my health pool and my region. Now again, the focus of the build is to use Leaf Barrier to generate as much ward as possible, at least to a reasonable amount. We already went over three ways to increase the effectiveness of Leaf Barrier and the ward that you can generate. One is simply to increase the amount of armor we have. Two is to increase our cooldown recovery speed. And three, increase our ward retention. Now, because the majority of the armor you generate comes from Thorn Shield, there's a fourth element to this, which is increased cast speed. Because the more cast speed we have, the more Thorn Shield we can cast, and the more of them we can stack at once. Cast speed is one of the most important stats on this build, and works both offensively and defensively. And we want to aim to have a really high amount of it. Now, there's one last unique that is absolutely necessary if you want to do what I did and generate 150,000 ward. Now, that by itself is not reasonable and would require special conditions, but the item itself is one of the best items we can get in the build. It is Thorn of Ambition, which is actually an idol, but it is a unique. It works like this. Every time you hit a rare enemy or a boss, you get a stack, stacking up to 20. This has a 1 second cooldown, so going up to 20 stacks would take 20 seconds. At 20 stacks, you deal 40% more cold damage, 40% more fire damage, and also, most importantly, you have 40% more armor. That's right, 40% more armor. That means 40% more ward generation. The downside of the item is that you lose all stacks after a few seconds if you don't hit any rare enemy. However, with this build, we always want to be on top of the boss, and there's not really a reason for us to run around because we don't really need to avoid most boss mechanics.
Okay, so let's bring it all together. How do you actually play this? It's actually very, very simple. When you enter Sprig and Form, if you have the node on the Shaman passive tree that gives you cast speed, you first summon a healing totem. Otherwise, all you do is hold on the button of Cast Thorn Shield. And the moment the cooldown of transforming into Werebear form is up, you transform. When you enter Werebear form, you want to use Rampage first and then Roar. The moment you can transform back into Spriggan form, you do so. But that still doesn't explain how I got to 150,000. To do that, you'll absolutely need to use a Water Shrine, which gives you 100% additional cooldown recovery speed. And if you can combine it with a Haste Shrine, you'll get even better results. And also, don't forget our favorite unique, Thorn of Ambition, so you're gonna want to have 20 stacks of that. That means having a rare enemy or a boss that is not going to die for a while because it takes 20 seconds to build up. Once you have a Water Shrine active, the cooldown of your transforms is going to go down to 2.2 or 2.1 seconds. Now I did try to theorycraft a way to make the duration of Thorn Shield infinitely stacking. This is because, again, every time you enter Werebear form, you increase the duration of all your stacks by a flat plus 4 seconds. And because we have our rotation where we go from tree to bear to tree, the cooldown of your transform ability would have to be less than 2 seconds if you want to use Roar of the Woodland to stack its duration infinitely. In other words, that would actually be impossible to do in the game, because the game just doesn't have enough ways to lower your cooldown to get it under 2 seconds. That doesn't mean, however, that we can stack the duration of Thorn Shield to have a very, very large overlap, and in that way push our war generation extremely high. Now, so far I've mostly talked about building as much wards as possible, but don't be mistaken thinking this is just a funny meme. This build actually works, it offers probably more defense than any other build out there, and I can't think of a safer option for hardcore at the moment. At the same time, if built correctly, it has really good AoE damage, even though single target is somewhat of a struggle. Now before I start going over all the details of the build, I want to demo some gameplay to show the clear speed of this build on a normal map. So here it is. Okay, okay, maybe not that one. Okay, so here's a normal empowered map at 300 corruption. Alright, let's get into the build itself. 
How to scale damage on the build. If you're familiar with the Spriginform tree, you might have considered that Barion Shell might be a good option, as it adds flat damage reflection to every stack of your Thorn Shield. When I was just trying to make this build work, using Briar Shell to deal reflect damage was the first thing I tried. What I found was that it had pretty good clear for just general mobs in the map, but when it came to bosses, it was very underwhelming and really didn't do a lot of damage at all, especially for bosses with very few attacks or a very slow attack speed. In fact, the damage on bosses was so bad that it felt like the build just didn't work. You see, getting this build to do damage is a problem. Not because of the werebear form part of the rotation. In fact, getting damage on werebear form is quite easy. But because when we are in spring form, basically the only thing we do is cast Thorn Shield and never stop. And that makes up about 50% of the time while you're playing. Now Thorn Shield does do damage. It's a spell that does physical spell hit damage and can be converted into cold. However, its base damage is very low and it's very difficult to scale its damage. And the few ways that Thorn Shield can be scaled damage-wise would require us to invest additional skill points into the Spring and Form tree. And because we're trying to build as much armor as possible, we simply don't have enough points. So how do we make it work? As I mentioned, the key is to find a way to use Thorn Shield to do damage without relying on its spell hit damage. Or at least have enough passive damage around you where you wouldn't need to be in a specific form and use a specific ability. The first thing I tried was to make this build low life and scale as much crit multiplier and damage with maul. I also used thorn shield and the crows to shred enemies armor. And while at first it was fun to kill elites in one shot, I just didn't have enough consistent damage for it to work. In the end, the way I did manage to have enough damage on the build, which is not insane by any means but respectable enough, is with the help of our old friend frostbite shackles, as it provides you a high percentage to apply frostbite on hit. I tried a couple of different things, but in the end a combination of spell damage, damage over time and ailments is what provided the most damage on the build. So the damage is a split between maelstrom and frostbite and other ailments, as well as the spell hit damage from lightning bolts. We boost our damage by having a really high amount of cold resistance, shred and pierce, and by getting spell damage from strength from the werebear form tree. But the most important thing about the build, of course, is... Break yourself upon I mentioned that you can't rely on thorn damage alone in this build. However, after building enough damage with cold damage over time, Going back to using Thorn Shell and building Reflect Damage surprised me in how good it was and how stupid. I mean, the build was already stupid, but this is even more stupid. -er 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 -er. The only thing you have to do to build Thorn Damage is equip Thorn Shell, increase your attunement by a decent amount, and almost everything that hits you, at least at 250 corruption, will instantly disappear from existence. Using thorns doesn't work on all enemies as some rare enemies mainly use damage over time and of course bosses have very slow attack speed generally. But when it comes to general mapping, reflect damage or thorns is very very effective and really excels in the endless arena as it contains no bosses, just waves and waves of enemies. In fact I tried to see how far I can push the endless arena especially with the newly implemented leaderboard. And while I eventually died on wave 863 to a server desync, pushing it to wave 1000, which is the current highest score, really wouldn't have been that difficult. I mean, some enemies deal like 10,000 damage in a single hit, but you have a health pool of like 30,000 to work with most of the time. The thing about the Endless Arena is that it requires a high time investment. Once you start it, it resets to one half of your previous score and there's no way to continue your progress, which means you can't stop and continue in the next session. You have to do it all at once. So this is how the actual build works. We start in the Werebear Form Tree with Voice of the Thicket, then most of our points go into Bringer of Storms, Crackling Assault, and Unending Storm. And if you don't know, this removes the cooldown off of Rampage and allows you to cast lightning bolts around you while rampaging. 
Then you want to get Wizened Claws, which gives you spell damage equals to your strength while in wearable form. And obviously you want to get a decent amount of strength because it increases our armor. We also take Intimidating Cry because it streamlines our gameplay and provides a lot of convenience. Also we use Warcry, and Warcry does a couple of things for us. The first is that it allows us to build stacks of Maelstrom. It also increases our cold damage and gives us a way to apply chill. Aside from that, it gives us 1 second of invulnerability when cast and a way to cleanse while in werebear form. I'll also quickly mention one more thing about Warcry, which is that unless you're running something like 1000 Corruption, you probably want to take the 3 points I put into the increased area and put them into Shallow Breath as the majority of your AoE damage is going to come from Reflect damage which requires enemies to hit you and if enemies are frozen, obviously they can't hit you. So you actually get more DPS by disabling Warcry's ability to CC enemies. The reduced cooldown would also give you more stacks of Maelstrom, so it's gonna be a damage gain. However, at the absolute highest difficulty, the freeze can be very useful and can save your life in certain situations. Maelstrom is the main damage source of our non-reflect damage. It scales with spell damage, damage over time, cold damage and attunement. Aside from its direct damage, it also benefits us in a couple of different ways. One is that if we take Energized, we can passively cast more lightning strikes around us, which do additional lightning damage as well as apply additional ailments like Frostbite and Ignite. Also, as I mentioned, we want a decent amount of attunement on the build, and Maelstrom scales exceptionally well with attunement. At least once you get to the point where you have 60 or more attunement. Maelstrom also gives us haste for the extra move speed, and Frenzy, which provides us with 20% increased cast speed. In the Spriggenform tree, we already went over all the nodes related to Throne Shield, but as I mentioned, the main damage source of the build it's going to be Reflect Damage, which is why we put 5 points into Briar Shell, which gives you flat Reflect Damage for every stack of Thorn Shield. In this way you can get to the point where you do 30,000 damage or more each time an enemy hits you. Obviously we do that with the help of Thorn Shell, which I'll get to in the itemization section. When it comes to your 5th ability, you have a couple of options. You can go Ice Thorns, which technically will be a DPS increase, but I don't really recommend it, because A, the gains with Ice Stones are pretty minimal, but most importantly, the online servers can't handle the amount of projectiles that you're gonna generate with Ice Stones, and if you use this ability, you're going to deal with a lot of desync and server issues. What I would recommend is taking Eteris Blessing which does a bunch of things for us. But first of all, we take Rose Bloom, which casts Eteris Blessing every time you cast Thorn Shield. Also, the main weakness of the build defensively is damage over time. So obviously getting permanent cleanse while in Spriggan form is very, very strong for us. Also, by using Eteris Blessing, we can automate summoning our healing totems. So this again streamlines the gameplay and allows you to make your entire bar just be Thorn Shield because as I continuously cast Thorn Shield, my healing totems are automatically summoned, and if you don't remember, they give me cast speed. Also, Eteris Blessing gives us elemental resistance, which is also ward retention, and a really high amount of poison resist. And the additional spell damage is nothing to write home about, but it does help. And here's just a quick overview again if you want to pause and take a look at the entire tree. Itemization. When it comes to itemization, you have a couple of options. The new Weaver Unique Relic for the Primalist that was added with 0.9.1 can potentially be really good, as it can reduce enemies' damage over time dealt, as well as apply slow to enemies with the use of your summoned vines. Now I'll just quickly mention that because the build basically always sits on maximum damage reduction from armor against hits, one of the weaknesses of the build is damage over time, so at least in theory this item can provide a lot of defense for us. However, you'd need to find one with really really good stats on it, or it just wouldn't be able to compete with a good spirit catcher. I've already talked about last steps of the living, and the information does not bear repeating. 
When it comes to your weapon, there are a couple of options. Wands are very good for us, and you'd want to get one of two types of wands. The first is the Ornate Wand, which provides a chance to apply poison on spell hit. The other is the Dragon Horn Wand, which gives you increased cast speed. The chance to poison obviously is going to be offensive, and the cast speed is going to serve both offensively and defensively, but mostly defensively. Whichever one of those you can get first, just make sure to craft cast speed on it, as it is the most important stat we can have on our wand. The other option of what weapon we can use is the Plague Bear's Staff. This is not a common drop, and might take you a while to get if you're trying to target farm it. I won't get into the details, but basically what this staff does is give you a chance to poison, as well as increasing your overall damage over time. Also, it gives you a small degen to your health, which could be potentially beneficial if you're trying to go low life with the build. If you are choosing to use a wand, you'd want to use the opulent focus with it, at least until you have enough defenses, where you can start using thorn shell, which is the best in slot item. Which brings us to what I so far only mentioned in passing, the unique shield thorn shell. Thorn shell is pretty much the only way in last epoch to scale reflect damage to a point where it does reasonable damage. The way this shield works is that it gives you a percent increase to the flat reflect damage that you have for each point of attunement that you have. So basically it scales your reflect damage with your attunement. Which means that if you are using thorn shell, you would want to get a fairly high amount of attunement. Do keep in mind that damage increase per attunement that you get from thorn shell can range in value between 5% and 9%. So when you are looking to find this shield, look for one with a high value, ideally 8 or 9%, as going from one with 6% to 9% is going to increase your thorn damage by 50%. Using Plague Bearer's Staff will substantially increase your DPS. At least the part of your DPS that doesn't include reflect damage. So that means bosses and certain enemies that don't really hit you all that much. However, if you're not fighting a boss, you usually want to have a wand with high cast speed and thorn shell in the offhand. But the good news really is that you don't have to settle for one or the other. As you can always quickly just change what weapon and offhand you are using to fit the situation at hand. There is another unique that you kind of need when you're trying to finalize the build, which is these Weaver Will boots. These boots can provide up to 35% damage reduction from damage over time while you have haste. And on this build, we have haste 100% of the time. It also gives us ward every time haste is refreshed, which is a few times a second. But don't just use the first set of those you find. You need to find one with good enough stats to replace our normal boots. And when it comes to Hazelroot, which is a low level unique scepter, you only want to use one of those if you can get 30 to 40% cast speed on it, which is one of the last goals when it comes to itemization on the build, but it should probably take you a few tries until you can craft one of those. The rest of your itemization is fairly straightforward. You always want to use frostbite shackles, you always want to use opal rings, and you always want to use an ancestral garb. In addition to that, the primalist helmet, Icewolf Pelt, has an inherent cold resistance and therefore is the best helmet we can use. The Eborian boots again give us more cold resistance, and therefore we use those too. And, as mentioned before, the Spirit Catcher is the best relic we have. When it comes to your amulet, currently I'm using a Cold Resist amulet, but this is only for the purposes of this video, where I'm trying to get as much word as possible. But under realistic conditions, you absolutely have to use an Oracle amulet, which provides up to 20% damage over time reduction. When it comes to your stats, for your helmet prefixes, you absolutely want to use the cooldown reduction while transformed. And for the second prefix, we don't have anything amazing because we don't use any of the skills that you get plus skill points to. That being said, however, the best ones would probably be damage over time while transformed, spell damage while transformed, or aspect of the boar duration. Also, on your relic, you'd want to get at least one point of the plus one to spring form 
as the main limitation of the build is how many points we can allocate into the Springform tree. The other affix I highly recommend that you have is a 100% chance to cleanse all ailments on potion use on your belt. You only need one tier of that on your belt for the cleanse to work and it makes your potion actually do something for us with this build, allowing you to use your potions to cleanse any negative effects that apply to you, like bleed, poison and resistance shred. This can make a very big difference on higher difficulties, especially again considering that our highest weakness is damage over time. Beyond that, you want to pretty much cap your resistances and get cold resistance and elemental resistance to increase your ward retention. On your wand, you absolutely need cast speed. The second prefix that you want to aim to have is either damage over time, spell damage or cold damage. But beyond that, nice affixes to have are chance to ignite and chance to poison. Or if you get a really good Weaver's Wheel Relic, chance to slow. Also make sure that you have enough Critical Strike chance avoidance to be over 100%. Rings are usually good to craft that on, as well as getting statues with that stat. When it comes to statues, the same concepts as before apply. Try to cap your resistances and increase your ward retention with Cold and Elemental Resist. The priority for itemization and target farming is as follows. Get last steps of the living and frostbite shackles. Then get a thorn shell with at least 8 or 9% attunement scaling on it, as it is the one thing that's gonna scale your damage the most. Or if you get really lucky with LP and can get a thorn shell with 20% to all resistances on it, use that. And finally get Plague Bear, which is gonna increase your damage to bosses. And eventually you're gonna try and find a Hazel Root with 30 or 40% cast speed on it. Also, always be on the lookout for the Weaver's Will boosts and Relic. If you find one of those, level them up as soon as possible. Especially the boots, because that is a very important item for us. It's up to you to decide if you want to itemize to have more defenses or more damage. Basically, to scale your defenses, you want to have elemental resistance and cold resistance that increases your ward retention. And if you want to build more damage, you simply get more attunement. This is how the items on my character look like at the time of editing this video. When it comes to your passives, as I mentioned before, health really doesn't give you anything in this build, so you want to take other stuff that might be useful for us, like strength, attunement and resistances, and in this case spell damage because nothing else was better. However, if you do choose to use Stormcrows with the build, you'd want to increase their health pool by taking nodes that increase minion health. Also, if you use the crows, you'd probably want to get 5 points in the Chichinus plating as it gives your crows armor. Aside from that, you want to take elemental penetration while transformed, all the strength and attunement you can get, thicket of the thorns is a must have, at least 5 points into river spirits, and piercing gale improves our cold damage. Aspect of might we take at least 8 points, and primal shifter is very good, but we don't need more than 3 points. In the Shaman Tree, we take the Attunement and Resistance Penetration. You'd always want to get Totemic Fury, which gives you 25% cast speed while you have an active Totem. And Earthen Supremacy, we only take for the extra Attunement. In the Beastmaster Tree, we take whatever Strength and Damage Reduction we can get, with the points that we have left. And to give you a complete overview of the Passive Tree, feel free to pause to see all the points allocated. And when it comes to your blessings, this is what you want to take. The first one doesn't really matter, it's either gold or unique items. Chance to ignite on hit increases your damage. Chance to get ward when hit is very good when dealing with large mobs. 20% to all resistances. And shred on hit to cold resistance. We take chance to apply frailty on hit. 
and for blessings that increase item drop we want to get an increased drop rate for either scepters or staves and depending on what you're farming for either shields boots or gloves And I should also quickly mention that I did try to experiment making this build work with low life, however what I found was that you have too much passive healing, and also the fact that we have a minimal health pool because we don't take any health in the build because health doesn't give us anything, means that I just can manage to stay at low life enough time to get the benefits, so yeah, it doesn't really work. There is one exception however, which is maybe using last steps of the living, when you are just transitioning into the build for the first time. But again, to be in low life, you need a large enough health pool, so if you already have a lot of health affixes on your gear, it might be beneficial in the very beginning. But otherwise, yeah, no, low life doesn't really work with the build. Because of the damage limitation of this build, which relies heavily on reflect damage, I did try to use a few different variations to make this build work. Specifically using minions like totems or the bear. And while I'll touch on the summoned bear in a second, I couldn't get thorn totems to really work all that well with this build, but I leave it to the community if someone can take my build and elevate it even more. Okay, using the bear. So the bear has an ability called retaliatory thorns, which releases a bunch of thorns every time your bear takes 75 damage. Building your bear around this ability has good synergy for us because by casting Thorn Shield on the bear, we can stack Bleed Chance on it and increase its physical damage. At the same time, when we use Hazel Root, we have a chance to cast Thorn Shield on ourselves whenever we cast it on any other target. And honestly, by trying it out, I think it's the best alternative for the normal build. What's interesting about building your bear like this is that the more damage your bear takes, the more thorns it releases, so it automatically scales with difficulty as enemies deal more and more damage. It's also actually safer than the more tankier build where we cast Thorn Shield on ourselves because we always have Taunt active on the bear, so the bear takes most of the heat for us. I tried it for a while on the Endless Arena and even unoptimized it worked really really well and under normal circumstances could probably carry you very far. But what happens is that as the bear takes higher and higher damage, it begins to release a gazillion projectiles at once, and because the servers of the game are in a horrible state, this is what happens. Okay, so you see how the thorns go out in a straight line and not home in on enemies? This is a sign of desync from the server, as the client stopped receiving the actual position of the thorns. Let's see how bad this one is. Let's start the clock. And stop. An entire minute. Try to play with that on wave 600 and see if you're still alive at the end. So for that reason alone, building your bear like this is completely unplayable, at least in online mode. I also tried to use crit bear, where your bear uses claw and basically always crits and has a very high crit multiplier, as there are actually pretty good nodes for the druid to build up damage on your companions. It worked okay, but it just wasn't as good as the normal build. I couldn't really find a suitable place to talk about leveling so far, and this video already turned out to be long enough as it is. 
However, it is important to talk about because if you simply follow the basic guide, you wouldn't necessarily understand how to level correctly and how to make the transition. And that transition is quite smooth, as most of our skills remain the same with only a few minor changes. I do have in the works at the moment another guide specifically for leveling a new druid character. However, because of time constraints, I'm not sure when I'll be able to finish it. So for the time being, this section is a condensed version of it. The leveling build is based on a build I call Electric Wear Car, where we use Rampage as the main damage ability to do lightning damage around us while charging forward. Rampage, being a movement ability, literally allows you to move through each map of the campaign as fast as it takes to run that distance in a straight line. And the damage from the lightning bolts is good enough to kill most enemies around you as you simply run past them to the next objective. So we get constant kills and XP with virtually zero downtime. A note about leveling. You really don't need any special gear until you finish the campaign and white items with enough forging potential can carry you until you get to monoliths. The most important thing is to find or craft raw health on all pieces of your gear and to take most of the early health nodes on your passive tree. Don't worry, as respecking those early nodes later is very cheap. Also make sure to craft movement speed on your boots. Don't worry about any other resistances or defense, you just need health and healing. When you're starting a new character as the Primalist, look for a two-handed weapon with added melee damage and health on hit. Remember you can also craft those if you have the affix shards. Use the Summon Wolf active and swipe until you have access to Maelstrom, and you want to use Fury Leap to move through the map faster. You want to start leveling Warcry in your second skill slot once you get access to it, when you unlock Maelstrom, slot it into your first skill slot and start leveling it together with Warcry. Look for a staff with high spell damage and craft either damage over time, cold damage or spell damage on it. Maelstrom is now your main damage ability. Use Tempest Strike on your bar for when you run out of mana between casts of Maelstrom. Reserve Warcry for when you are surrounded by enemies and need to stun them and heal. When you start getting points for Maelstrom, spec at least 2 points into healing winds before anything else as you're going to need the sustained heal in the early game. Once you have a couple of points into Whirlpool on the Warcry skill tree that allows Warcry to create stacks of Maelstrom, you can start using Warcry offensively. Remember to keep crafting more health on your gear as you level up. After you unlock your druid specialization and your third skill slot, Slot Werebear form into it and start leveling it. You can replace Warcry on your bar with Werebear form at this point. Here's a quick tip about Werebear form. You can jump over certain terrain with the use of Maul. This allows you to create quite a few shortcuts in many areas of the game. Once you unlock Unending Storm on the Werebear form tree, which removes the cooldown off of Rampage, you want to start using Rampage as your main damage ability and run through the entire map with it as enemies around you die to the lightning bolts. Also at this stage of the game we want to spec into Power of the Storm and Energized on the Maelstrom tree which passively casts more lightning bolts around you. At this point you'd want to look to upgrade your staff to a higher damage one. You can always buy a new one if you didn't get any good drops. As our fourth skill, we pick up Summon Spriggan for extra healing, spell damage and crit avoidance. At this stage, the build is very strong and all you have to do is use Rampage to run to the next point on the map while almost all enemies around you die. In fact, this build is so good at running through the map that at some point you're going to find yourself underleveled at which point it can be a good idea to run some of the maps that have higher enemy density a few times to get a few extra levels, at least if you're playing on hardcore and can't afford your character dying. The first suitable map for XP farming is Necropolis of the Deep in the Imperial Era. After that it is recommended to farm some XP in Eoboria between the Eoborian Forest and the Wingari Fortress, 
as the Wangari Fortress holds a boss fight that is very dangerous and the next area holds an even more dangerous boss. If you're not playing on hardcore, however, dying might not affect you as much. Another area that is excellent for XP farming is all the maps on Lagon's Isle. And in fact, the monster density in that area is so high that I recommend that you complete the quests in that area for the extra XP, even though they're not mandatory. Aside from the possibility of needing to do some XP farming, the rest of the campaign plays out much the same. When you get level 50, you can start leveling up Spriggan form for when we make the transition away from the leveling build. It won't be of any use until then, but we don't really need our fifth skill anyway until that point. Now here's me killing Majessa at the end of the campaign on Hardcore. I've actually rushed to get to the end here and my character is underleveled and missing some passive points. With the amount of HP that I have, nothing can really one-shot me and my damage is really good for this stage of the game. As you can see, this is a hardcore character and most of my resistances are at zero, I have no statues and all my items are low-level items that I kept crafting more health on. Even my staff is a level 29 item that I bought from the merchant. The point is not that you shouldn't upgrade your gear and idols, but that it is necessary to get to this stage of the game. At this point you should start progressing through monoliths. The first thing you want to do is to get to the Blood, Frost and Death timeline and farm for Mrs. the Undying for last steps of the living, which has a 50% drop rate. You can't immediately change your skills and passives for the Stormcrows plus low life variant or wait until you have a couple more items like opal rings and cooldown recovery speed affixes. Stormcrow's skill tree should look like this, with the first thing you take be the extra intelligence. A note on this variant. You are considered at low life in Last Epoch when at 35% health or less. This build provides too much passive healing and therefore last steps of the living alone cannot manage to keep us at true low life the majority of the time. We therefore don't put points into Berserker unless we can also use Exsanguinous. The Crows, however, will continue to give you ward while you are below 50% HP, which we manage consistently, so we still benefit from silver berries this way. This is how the passive tree looks like for the early Stormcrow variant. In any case, your next priority is to rush towards finishing up all timelines and unlocking empowered monoliths. Trying to target farm any item at this point is kind of a waste of time. Keep gearing up, get cooldown recovery speed affixes, opal rings and opulent focus ASAP. Once you transition into the first variant of the build, which is Stormcrows plus low life, there's virtually nothing as you progress through monoliths that can kill you and you can ignore basically all boss mechanics. You don't even need good gear at this point, which is evident if you look at my character's gear on screen, which is pretty garbage as far as affixes. Also, in case you didn't notice, this is a hardcore character. With very basic items and no uniques except last steps, which isn't even necessary here, my damage is very decent, my move speed is very high, and I effectively can't die to anything here. Once you unlock Empowered Monos, immediately go and start farming Blood, Frost and Death for Frostbite Shackles. And from there on, you know what to do. Alright, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and that you try the build for yourself. I should also have a written guide of the build at lastepochtools.com if you prefer to use that site for the guide as it can show you the progression of the skill trees and everything. And the link to that of course would be in the description below. Thanks for watching and bye!